Hi guys, so I'm very excited to be here today and, and tell you a bit more about uh, Sketch, Sketchfab, the 3D world, and, and what I learned from, from building uh, Sketchfab. So I'm Alban, I'm the co-founder and CEO of Sketchfab, which is a web platform to publish 3D files. I'm going to start by a very easy statement, is that 3D is everywhere. And the reason is pretty simple, is that the world we live in is in three dimensions. We're just surrounded by 3D files. I think everything in this room has been designed in 3D before getting into the real life and manufactured. And the ads we see, the games we play, the cars we drive, our phones, everything heavily relies on 3D files. It's just everywhere. And to me, what's even more exciting is 3D scanning. Uh, I put this little quote from Aristotle, art imitates nature. If you look at how like human beings have always, always tried to, to replicate nature and we started with drawing and painting and then with photography and then with video and for me the next big thing is like 3D capture and if you look at recent events like Apple buying PrimeSense, the makers of Kinect uh, which is used by a lot of 3D scanning software and also Google starting the Tango project which is a phone able to capture 3D data just means that our smartphone is, is going to be like a 3D scanner very soon. But also, 3D is really getting democratized with 3D scanning, 3D printing, and great companies like MakerBot and, and all the guys pushing this ecosystem forward. 3D is still super hard to handle. There are hundreds of different file formats. 3D files are huge. You need expensive software. You need to install the software. Uh, files are heavy takes time to download, so we don't see that many files, 3D files around on the internet. So as a result, although we live in a 3D world, the web is pretty much 2D, and if you look at like an e-commerce website, so you'll see like 10 pictures of a product, and for me it's really insane, like you're gonna see like 10 angles of a product, whereas it's in 3D in the real world, so there is no reason for that. And except for video games, who are really like pushing it forward, the rest of the internet is, is pretty much 2D. So that's why we created Sketchfab, uh, which is the first platform to publish, share and embed interactive 3D files. The high level concept, if you look at any file format, each file format gave birth to a major platform to host and display them. So that's YouTube for videos and SlideShare for presentation, SoundCloud for, slide, for sounds, uh, Flickr for photos, and we really want to do the exact same thing for 3D files, so it's, it's rather straightforward. So here's a quick demo of Sketchfab, just to show you how it works. So it's a freemium service, like, like any SaaS platform. You can register in, in just a few clicks. We take 28 native 3D formats, spend a lot of energy accepting all the formats and all the textures and components of a 3D file. And then in just a few seconds, you have the 3D file in your browser. You can just send the URL to anyone or embed it on your own website. Have a real-time uh, material editor so that you can tweak the file so it looks as, as beautiful and as perfect as inside your free software. We have integrations with, with the major tools out there so that you can publish directly from there. Great model of the rock. Classic social layer on, on top of the viewer. That's an embed on the Tumblr blog.
Okay, so just just wanted to show you a few examples. It's really exciting to see how many different type of users use Sketchfab. Uh, I could spend like hours just browsing through files and showing you examples. I just picked four. So OpenDesk, you may have heard about it. It's like a kind of open source IKEA. They just design like furniture that anyone can build at home, and they use Sketchfab to to show the actual uh, pieces of furniture in 3D on their own website. African Fossils is a project by National Geographic and Autodesk. Uh, they went to Africa and, and 3D scanned uh, fossils of 20 million years old, and then they use Sketchfab to display it on their website, and you can also download and print the, the scans. Uh, HTC just started using this for all their new smartphone launches, so if you go to the HTC website and look at their new M81 uh, smartphone, you'll be able to see it in 3D with Sketchfab. And just another completely different example, but uh, so in November it was the anniversary of the GFK assassination, and we had a user who actually designed a diorama of, of the scene of the assassination with like the the trajectory of the bullets, and it was embedded just as really like as a piece of information. So it was a, a great use case use case as well. So now I'm going to move to what I learned from from building Sketchfab. Um, that we started two years ago. So do only one thing, but do it really well. I say it all the time. So we started Sketchfab two years ago. We're only two people. And there's only so much things you can do when you're two people. And you get requested all the time to like add stuff to your product. So we got contacted by, by all 3D printing services who wanted to connect uh, to our database and to print it. We got uh, contacted by people doing like virtual reality and they wanted us to do augmented reality and all sorts of people but if you start like accepting any requests you're just gonna lose focus and, and lose this, the soul of your product. Don't do it alone. I always wanted to, to start my own business and I wasted like years brainstorming by myself on my own ideas and just ended up doing nothing. So. Ideas, ideas are free, and ideas really become real only if, only if there is more than one people working on it, really. Uh, so Sketchfab became real uh, when more than one people was working on it. So and when I met my co-founder, Cedric, he had been working for a year on, on the tech, and he had told nobody about it. And Sketchfab became a reality only when we gathered and, and started making it real. And it, yeah, I, I had a, a great team matters more than a, a great ID. Uh, investors will, will tell you that all the time. And it truly really applies to building the product as well. Don't raise too much too soon. From it's the surest way to, to respect the two first rules. If you have too much money, you're just going to start building more than just one thing. And you're going to start hiring people and building features, and you don't even know if people are going to use them. One of our competitors, we started at the exact same time. They raised a lot of money, and we bootstrapped for a year with 15K. And they hired 15 people, and they built like 100 features. And at the end of the day, their users only needed one feature, and that was the one we were building at Sketchfab. Uh, so we really waited one year for, for raising our first round, once we had a, a clearer idea of what we were building. And you're welcome to raise like 10 million when, when you exactly know how you spend it and, and like to scale your business. But, but before that, uh, I don't think it's really useful. But on the other end, always be raising. So the people we ended up raising with, so Balderton, which is a, a firm based in the UK, we first met them two years before we raised. And that's something I think Fred Wilson wrote a blog post this morning about it uh, while investing in... Crowd, crowd rise. He announced an investment this morning and he said he met, he met the guys four years before making this investment today. He said he, met two, he, he took two years to invest in SoundCloud and just the, the best way for investors, for investors to do their due diligence is just to, to follow how our company evolves and, and grows and, and delivers. Accelerators can help, uh, especially if you are a first time founder. Um, I'm a first time, time founder, so I have zero track record. And it's really hard to, to be like, listened to by investors and partners. And, and going through an accelerator, like a good accelerator, can really uh, like bring some form of, um, not validation, but 
almost like a standard or label uh, to what you're doing and it really open doors so if you can get into a good accelerator I think it, it's worth it. Leverage your community so this is something uh, we did almost without noticing but pretty early on we started having very engaged users who reached out and say they wanted to to make their workflow easier and like build tools on top of Sketchfab. So we started, we released an API very early on. It was really crappy, but it was live and anybody could use it. And people just started building stuff on top of Sketchfab. And they built, built stuff like to, to let them publish their, their work directly from uh, their 3D software to Sketchfab. And it, it turned out to be our distribution strategy. One thing I really learned by building Sketchfab is that even though you have the best technology on earth, if you have no users, it's really useless. And to have users, like your distribution strategy is really the key to get there. And so at Sketchfab, our, our distribution strategy has really to, been to, to integrate with all the creation tools. So you can think of it a bit like on, on iMovie, you can publish to YouTube in one click. And we're, we're trying to do the same with uh, Sketchfab, so we're natively integrated in Photoshop that you can publish a 3D file from Photoshop to Sketchfab. We just got natively integrated in, in Blender. And then we have users who built add-ons for Autodesk, SketchUp, and almost every 3D software. We even have an exporter for Minecraft. So you can publish a 3D file, like a Minecraft file directly to Sketchfab. So step one is to, to get all creation tools to publish to Sketchfab. And step two is from Sketchfab to the entire web. So partner with all publishing platforms to make sure that our embeds are supported on Kickstarter and LinkedIn and Reddit and Facebook. Um, so yeah, never, never forget your distribution. Be global from day one. It's really easy to, to, to think this way when you're uh, here in the US. Uh, for me, being French from Paris, uh, it wasn't. And I'm really amazed by all the startups starting in Paris and launching a website in French. For me, it's, it's really stupid. Um, so with the tools you have today, it's really easy to build a, a, a website that's all like in English and accessible to anyone. Uh, but on the other hand, it's, it's really important to have a local presence and to have a foot in the US when you want to have a, a global platform because I don't know what's the ratio of internet users in the US, but it turned out that something like 40% of our users are in the US and our partners and our investors and a lot of people are here, so that's why we realized pretty early on that we wanted to have uh, a foot in the US. Fight for your brand. Um, if you build like a, a software as a service product or a platform or a marketplace, you'll have a lot of people asking for an unbranded solution. I think that when you are a one-year-old company, that's pretty much the only thing you have is your brand. <laughs> so except if the guys are ready to pay a lot of money. I think it's the model of Aviary, like the image editing tool. It's free to use, it's a branded version, and it's 20K a year to use the unbranded version. So we had a lot, a lot of requests to, to do unbranded um, viewer, and then we signed up HTC with a branded viewer, and now we can say, well, if HTC is okay to have our branded viewer, then anyone can have our branded viewer. And YouTube never did unbranded, Vimeo doesn't do unbranded and SoundCloud and SlideShare and like platforms don't, don't really do that. Except if it's really part of your feature like, like other video players. Uh, just ask, it's really one thing I've learned as well is entrepreneurs lo love to help other entrepreneurs. So if you don't ask, you'll never know the answer. And if you ask, you'll be amazed by how, how much help you can get from other people. People love to share what they've learned, and, and people usually love to help, so just ask. Do things at scale. For me, scale is really the most fascinating thing in software, and that, that's really why, why we, we build software, is that you build it once. Well, it's, it can take a lifetime, but you make a product once, and then it can be used by one people or 100,000 people. It's still the same piece of software. But building a software that scales, uh, encompasses like many areas of scaling that you should really think about from day one. So first about the technology. Uh, so we use WebGL and HTML5. 
and that was the best way for us to build a, a scalable solution. So as soon as it's web-based, uh, it's much easier to, to build it once and it will work on any browser. Well, you have to consider all browsers, but uh, we never built an app uh, because we have, we have a web view and it's, it's just a smarter, well, it was the smartest way for us to build it uh, given the number of people we have on our team. And then WebGL is meant to scale on any platform, so instead of if you start be building stuff in, in Flash, you'll have to build them for each platform, and you don't really want to do that. Scale the product. Uh, it's it's, a, it's, it's a, a situation you'll face all the time, people asking for custom features, and like big clients want their custom solution. Uh, don't do that because you'll spend ages working on something that you'll, you, you'll, you won't be able to maintain afterward afterwards. Scale your infrastructure. Although you don't need 10 servers when you have 5 visitors a day, uh, you need to be ready when you have 5,000. So we went from 50 visitors at the same time to 5,000 in one day. <laughs> we couldn't handle it, so that was a shame. Uh, scale the team. For me, it was the hardest thing to do, but you need to, to, uh, to set up processes so that it's really easy to onboard people and, and make them feel happy. Uh, and if you don't do it from the beginning, it's hard. And I conclude by just say, uh, do it. Life is an internship until you have your own company. Uh, there is no reason not, no reason not to try. Uh, and it's been the best experience of my life so far. So if you have an idea, just just get started. Right. Question. Do you have uh, questions? Yep. Could you start with your uh, name and company, please? from US Life. Um, obviously, what's your revenue model and how do you make money? So right now, the best analogy is SoundCloud. We started really as a software as a service and freemium model, so free to upload music and, and paid for version if you want like more storage and customized viewer. And then they are, right now, they are moving slowly to from software as a service to monetizing the content and the audience. And now that we have more than 100,000 free files, we can just start money, money. So right now we already have uh, revenue with this software as a service model, and we're brainstorming around how to monetize the audience and, and the content. Any other questions? Um, Alex, you from Dos Alves. Um, you mentioned not to raise a lot of money, which I thought was kind of interesting. Um, when you raised the $500,000, can you share with us, like, well, it depends on what valuation and what percentage you're going to give up. So, obviously, if you could raise it at $10 million versus $100 million, that's a different story. So, I think the point is, is not necessarily to not raise a lot of money, it's to raise a lot of money only when you really know what to do with it. Uh, and you can do that when, when you have a product that can scale. And then, of course, it depends what part of your company you, s you sell for. Uh, being a French company, <coughs> it's easier to make because it's easier to raise less money because there is less money available. <laughs> uh, cool. Time for one last one. Uh, do you guys have a for full use? Uh, I'm looking for specific demographics which you can do. Do you offer that? Yeah, our, our pro version lets you have your private portfolio and, and share private work with, with clients. Cool. Thank you very much. So you'll be around for the rest of the event and after that, we'll be